and I will read you a book. You are so beautiful to me. Good job, Mary. You are so Beautiful to me, can't you see? You're everything I hope for, everything I need. You are so beautiful. As we've just seen in that powerful video from Dove called Cost of Beauty, being a teenage girl and navigating body image on social media is challenging and often harmful. 70% of Canadian youth believe social media can make young people want to change their appearance. Cost of Beauty told the story of a young woman named Mary, and she's with me right now. Please welcome Mary Esposito. <laughs> said to Mary is, Mary, am I going to freak you out if I cry? Because I cannot watch The Cost of Beauty without losing my mind. It's beautifully done. And the part that gets me every time is when you open up your phone at age 12. Okay? So you get your phone. Was that your first experience with social media? So I actually, my first experience was when I was 10 and I got my first iPad, but it wasn't until I was 12 and got my first phone that I really downloaded the social media apps. What did you start seeing on social media that you think took you down maybe a dangerous path? So I originally was on there for fashion. I really love fashion, but then I started to see uh, Thinspo, and what that stands for is Thin Inspiration, and the purpose of Thinspo is to encourage the viewers to restrict their eating and lose weight. So I soon began to consume a lot of that kind of content. And what, what are they saying in those Thinspo videos? Like, what's happening? Um, there's a lot of diet tips going on, calorie counting, and then body checking. Um, so for example, thigh gaps were a big one. Okay, so you're seeing these images, you're bombarded by these images, what do you start doing? I start emulating uh, what I see online because at that age I was very impressionable. I saw these people getting tens of thousands of likes. 
I wanted attention, so I started restricting my eating as well. How bad did it get, Mary? Uh, I was actually hospitalized when I was 13 and had to live in a residential facility for a couple months. Now, I want to bring your mom into this conversation because part of the reason why this video hits so, so hard for me is I have a 12-year-old daughter at home. Audrey, when you sing in that video, that's the thing that pushed me over the edge every time. It's beautiful to see your love for your daughter. I want to know when you started to realize something was wrong with Mary. Thank you, Tracy. Um, I first realized something was wrong when Mary was in the sixth grade. As she mentioned, she had an iPad when she was um, in fifth grade, but once she got her phone, that's when I really saw her engagement with social media significantly increase. So some of the things I saw that I knew you know, things were changing and wrong, were that she would hide away and scroll on her phone and I would go looking for her and find her tucked away somewhere. Um, we had rules. I would go around the, the um, pick up phones at nine o'clock at night from all the daughters, I have three girls, and then I would put them in the kitchen and sometimes I would notice, oh, where did her phone go? Uh, she, it would somehow make its way back upstairs at night. So she was on social media at night. Um, she isolated in her room. She really wanted to be left alone. And over time, then she started to not want to engage in family activities or like family meals in particular. She became more sort of self-conscious and would wear baggy clothes to hide her body. She didn't want to put on a bathing suit. She wanted to, you know, sort of cover things up. And, um, she also, we would sit down and look at her phone and it was just a red flag that she had downloaded these weight loss apps, these um, exercise and calorie counting apps. That was a big red flag to me. And then lastly, her relationship with food really changed. So really those were, those were my red flags that something was really wrong. Mary, how are you feeling now? Oh, uh, she covered a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You feel like you're on the other side of it now? I definitely do. You feel mm -hmm. like you're on the other side of it. Tell me about what that journey was like to recovery. How'd you get here? So outpatient therapy wasn't working. Mm -hmm. And so when I was 13, I went inpatient um, and missed a couple months of school because I was living in a residential facility. Um, in that facility, I weight restored and I, once I discharged, I was matched with a therapist and a dietitian, both of whom I still work with today. Okay, the weight restoration you mentioned to me before, that was hard, huh? Yes, so yeah. weight restoration was really hard. Part of my eating disorder, and everyone's is different, but part of mine was restricting eating yeah. and trying to get smaller and lose weight. Mm -hmm. So having to wake up every day and eat all those meals and weight restore was like my worst nightmare. Totally, because you had been on this strict <laughs> yeah, eat yeah. less, eat less, and now it's like, no, eat more. That's got to be hard and it's got to be scary. I want to know what your relationship is like now with social media. Yeah. Talk to me about how you interact with it and how you self-regulate it so you don't go back to that place. Right. So something that I know now is more about the algorithm. So whenever I see content such as Thinspo, I don't like, comment, or engage with it in any way. And that signals to the algorithm that I'm not interested in that. And so it won't continue to put that content on my feed. Mm -hmm. so. so good. And you've mm -hmm. also managed to do some really positive pivoting with your social media. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I actually, in the uh, eating disorder treatment facility, I learned how to knit and crochet as along with all a lot of the other girls because we weren't allowed like to do much else. Um, mm -hmm. And so when I got out, I actually started a business um, to share my art. And I've been doing that for the past six years. And I've grown to over 300,000 social media followers at Shop Purple Pear. And I share my art, but I also use it as a platform to talk about important social issues such as eating disorder recovery and art therapy. And actually, I made this for you. Oh, thank you. That is so sweet. Yeah, I love it. I didn't have any hair help today, so I'll just do a little sign pony there. That's amazing. So you're talking about financial, whatever. It's not great. I, I, but the, the, the scrunchie's pretty, so it's worth it. Um, you talk about fi like financial help. You talk about the beautiful arts and crafts that you are creating, and you talk about making sure that mm -hmm. other people out there are self-confident and don't fall into the traps you fell you fell in. But I want to know if you had an advice for any 12-year-old out mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. that might be going down the rabbit hole. What would you tell them? 
I would say to any 12 year old out there, well, first of all, to any 12 year old watching this, um, stop and go read a book. But, <laughs> you know, but, no, but right. seriously, um, <laughs> Recognize that there is such a thing as Photoshop and airbrushing. I think a big problem for me was I had no idea that existed, right? Yeah. So when I saw these images, I was like, oh, that's real. So I was comparing my unfiltered, natural preteen body to these filtered, unnatural um, people I saw on social media. Yeah. So just recognizing, you know, that filters, airbrush exists, what you're seeing is not necessarily real. Um, what is real is never perfect, and what is perfect is never real. Oh my gosh, can we hear it for that piece of advice? <laughs> Wise. Marion, thank you so much. Thank you for dealing with my own tears as we watched your own story online. Um, and it's a beautiful story, but the best part about it for me is that you're on the other side of it. And now right. you're helping other kids make sure they don't go down um, the same road. So, Mary, thank you so much.